This is The Sim Pit. I'm your host, Sean Cole, but the real star today's show is one of my all-time favorite DIY projects, that being a 3D-printed steering wheel for sim racing. This made-of-plastic wheel is intended to be used on my very powerful Sim Experience Aki 4 steering wheel, which totally sounds crazy to me. In recent years, we have seen a boom of direct drive steering wheels. And in most cases, these super powerful wheelbases came all alone and required users to figure everything from the motor back, from the quick release to what goes in your hands, the actual wheel rim. And these steering wheel options have ranged anywhere from 500 up to multiple thousands of dollars, depending on your selection. This project is a potential answer to that problem and it gives you total freedom of choice in what kind of parts and design you want. I mean, anything that you can imagine or design in your own head, you could build yourself or you could copy from others. So before we get too deep into this project, let me just say a few things. Number one, DIY projects are not for everybody. They are for tinkerers. They're for people who like puzzles, people who like to find solutions to problems. For everyone else, they could be a very frustrating experience. Why won't this go in the f***ing hole? And that takes me right to number two. DIY projects are always changing on the fly. As you progress through the project, you might find a problem and the solution to the problem might be a total redesign change, a complete restart, completely unassembling and reassembling, starting over from scratch. These things are quite common in DIY projects and again, can be frustrating for some. Damn it, this is never gonna fucking work. And that alone can cost you lots of extra money in the end in unused parts or in time in unused 3D printed parts. In fact, here are just some of the parts that I printed and didn't need in the end. I had to be patient, I had to be very adaptable, and I had to be willing to solve problems along the way. Welcome to the world of DIY. Now before we get started, I do want to mention one more thing. This is more of a chronicle of my experiences than a step-by-step -step how to. And the reason for that is this, for every change in design that you make, for every component that you choose, it will drastically affect the way every 3D printed wheel goes along. So this is more of me chronicling my experiences, showing you where things went well, showing you where things went wrong, and hopefully that'll help you if you pursue this project like I did. Also, I did film almost every part of this live on Twitch, so you can check it there anyway. So let's get started. The first thing is choosing your design. What wheel? What type of wheel? Are you building a wheel hub? Are you building a butterfly style? Do you want to display? What kind of shifters? What kind of quick release? All those choices are part before you even get things going underway. Looking through the website Thingiverse on a search for steering wheels, I found the McLaren GT3 rim designed by Fox 85 and thought it would work as a good first or starter project. It was a modern butterfly style rim that included paddle shifters and instructions to complete the wheel. I then had to decide on a printer capable of printing the wheel that I wanted. I chose a Creality Ender 5 Plus for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to go into right now. To be honest with you, 3D printing is an entire topic in its own and I am no expert. So this project really is for those who already own 3D printers, those who already know how to do 3D printing, because otherwise, I gotta be honest with you, you're taking on a second hobby without even knowing so if you don't already 3D print and know what you're doing. In my case, I didn't. That's the printer I chose and it worked out okay. So after hours, no, 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 days, after a week of 3D printing, I finally had all of my plastic parts. I also went through the instructions supplied by Fox 85 on building the wheel, and when I realized that the buttons, the switches, the controllers, everything inside the wheel was at a lower level than I wanted to build a wheel in, I actually talked to Derek Spear, and he volunteered to send me the internals to build this up in high-end sim racing fashion. That included a Micro 32 board along with its plug, all of the buttons, as well as four encoders. 
I also decided that I'd be covering the plastic with the carbon fiber vinyl wrap and the grips with a faux or imitation leather as well. In total, the parts ended up being like this. A Micro 32 controller, 80 bucks. Rotary encoders with push button, five pack, which I used four for $90. Random buttons, 10 bucks. Carbon fiber wrap, 10 bucks. Vinyl leather wrap, 15 bucks. Black PLA filament, 20 bucks, and I only used half the roll. Magnets for $10, I used four of the 10 that I got. Extra nuts, bolts, glue, wire, throw in 20 bucks for a total cost of $245. So, with these new internals, with these new shaped buttons and encoders, I had to go back to redesigning the wheel or altering the Fox 85 design. For that, I used a program called Tinkercad, which is an online web-based, super generic CAD drawing program. This included larger holes for the buttons. It also included slightly changing the spacing of the buttons due to their size. Also, the encoders had a larger internal dimension and had to be completely relocated to a new spot more in the middle of the wheel than the original design. Three reprints later, we got it kind of close and it was time to start actually assembling the wheel. Starting with the faceplate, I was gonna be installing all of the buttons, all of the encoders. In the end, I did have to do a little more finish work with a grinder to get a perfect fit. Eventually, everything fit in place nicely. And from here, I can move right into wiring. In my trials and errors, one of the first things I learned is that it was gonna be easier to have my board on the faceplate with the buttons and encoders rather than in the back plate and needing a wire connecting them together. So the first step really was to hot glue that controller board into the back of the plate. And if I really wanted to, I probably could have put that into the design, but I wasn't ready for another reprint at this point in time. For every type of build, each will have its own wiring requirements. For me, I'm getting all of my buttons and encoders into specific pins on the board. And for the most part, I can have a common ground. So I pick my ground side and start connecting all of my buttons and stringing them together. I then connect that line to the header for the negative side of the board. However, on the positive side, each button will have its own positive side header on the board. In the end, I used heat shrink on any connected wires and then used hot glue to hold my wires in place and out of the way of getting pinched. I chose to separate the encoders and daisy chain them together with a common ground wire and then wired each encoder to the board in the necessary pins or header spots. Essentially, wiring a push button encoder is like wiring three separate buttons. So 12 wires later, we're done with that as well. Again, I use heat shrink on any connected wires and then use hot glue to hold the wires in a safe place. This pretty much finishes the front, and we can now move on to the back part of the wheel. The back part of the wheel will only hold the dongle or USB connector. The original design used a different design than I'm using, so I had to cut away a hole and glue that into place. Because the main board is on the front, the wire from the connector needs to reach the board from the back plate of the wheel. And that takes us to the shifters. They are also mounted to the back box or plate of the wheel. This means their wires will also need to reach the front plate of the wheel and will be the longest wires on the entire assembly. The shifter assemblies use a base with a paddle lever that bolts into it. It then uses magnets that fit into holes and use the magnetic power to hold them in place. I ended up doubling the amount of magnets using four instead of two, but thicker magnets would have worked as well. And in the end, it just made the click a little stronger. Inside of the shifter is a three wire micro switch. I did have to use an ohm meter to find out which two wires to use for when pressed in. This assembly then bolts to the back of the wheel and its wires go to the board like our other button. Tie one side into the ground and give each button a positive post on the board as well. At the end of the paddle levers are two holes. This is where we can bolt on our paddle ends. Now before we close this wheel rim up and call it complete, we still need to mount our quick release as the mounting holes are actually inside of the case. 
Now my quick release is rather large. When I went to mount it, this presented us with our next problem that was going to require a solution. So I needed a spacer. It was back to Tinkercad for a quick design. Eight hours of printing later, we had a spacer and we could actually mount our wheel to our quick release and then close up the wheel. It starts by slowly lowering the faceplate down on top of it, making sure not to pinch any of the wires inside. I keep pressing it together until finally it fits into place. I can then start putting the grips into the back plate box, start adding the bolts that hold the grips in and the entire box together. That is when I then realized my hardware wasn't the exact same as the original designers. The nuts weren't going to fit down into the recessed holes and it was going to require either yet another redesign or luckily my bolts were a little long and my nuts were large enough to go on the outside of the case, which doesn't look as cool, but did have the job continuing on. I then installed the middle bolts and the next thing you know, well, a few weeks later, we have an operational steering wheel. But the big question still remains, will it last? Will it break? Will this thing explode in my hands when I use it for sim racing? And I'm gonna test it unfinished before I spend that extra time and labor. I wanna make sure it actually works. So I mount it to my AccuForce base. I plug it into Windows and Windows recognizes it. And because of my configuration, I have to use the DSD configurator tool to map my encoders and buttons. Once I did that, I realized I actually had a little problem. I had backward wired a couple encoders. So I had to tear the whole thing apart again, put it all back together again, get into that DSD configurator, confi confirm that everything was working properly, and then finally fire it up in iRacing and map my controls and see if this thing actually works. Out on the track, the wheel was far more rigid than I thought it would be. There is as near to zero flex, twist, or wiggle in the wheel itself as there possibly could be. And to my amazement and much to my pleasure, the wheel was working like a champ. I kept expecting to hear some race ending crunch or the sound of plastic separating in failure, but there were no funny or strange noises. Just a perfectly working wheel that between its weight, its rigidity, and even its look felt as if I had spent a fortune on this thing. The wheel itself is gigantic and people have already made fun of it. However, we measured this off and sure enough, it is the exact dimensions of a McLaren GT3 rim. The big fat grips prevent me from wrapping my fingers around the wheel. This is a good habit to learn for anyone who races in real life. It also makes me hold the wheel a bit more gently and I get more feeling out of the force feedback because of that. The upper buttons are absolutely perfect, giving me three buttons and very easy to reach and operation for each hand. The lower buttons are harder to reach but are in good position for towing or pit limiter. The kind of things you don't need on the fly. The encoders were a little more out of reach and were used well for other in-car adjustments. In the end, I had more than enough buttons, dials, and mapping ability. The shifters were also surprisingly stiff or strong. This was one of my areas of concern going in, but the magnets, when doubled up, were quite strong and can be felt and heard making that super positive click when the action happens. The paddle levers themselves had a tiny bit of flex. They feel strong enough to last, but are the weakest part of the wheel rim overall. I could always print thicker ones later if I want that stiffness or feel like they won't hold up. So after some initial testing, which ended up being a few races on the raw or bare version of the wheel, I realized that it was strong. It was highly functional and it was going to last a very long time. So it was going to be worthy of extra investment of time as well with some finish work, making it feel and look good as well. And that was going to require tearing it all the way down to its bare parts once again. I wanted to finish the center of the wheel on carbon fiber. I removed all the buttons and then started heat shrinking my carbon fiber wrap to the face plate. This was my first time doing such a thing and it took some learning. Heat it, stretch it, relief cut it for complex corners, and a while later, many hours later, it was complete. 
Covering the back, which is thicker, would be more challenging. The process was the same. Heat it, relief cut it, stretch it, but it required a ton more repetition until finally we had the back covered as well. I decided to also cover my paddle shifters and found their shape hard to work with. But again, a bit of heat, a bit of stretch, relief cuts, and we got those wrapped as well. And once all the wrapping was done, a little trim work with the X-Acto blades to cut holes in any excess material. The grips were being covered in a vinyl leather wrap. I cut the leather to the approximate shape that I needed and then used spray-on adhesive to start attaching the leather to the plastic grip. Getting the vinyl to take shape of the grip is a very big challenge. The leather has a little bit of stretch to it, but it was harder than the wrap to get it to really conform. More heat, more stretching, and more relief cutting to get it to even make some of the curves of the handle. I found that too much heat would cause a delamination of the vinyl, and in the end, I really wasn't super happy with the way the vinyl was attached. I had spots that were missing covering and a bit of sticky from the glue that was now exposed. I had spots that just wouldn't lay down nice and left bubbles. And I also had spots where my overlap was sloppy. But regardless of the flaws, I got it finished and the wheel was ready for reassembly. To finish off the wheel, I added some printed labels and when it was all finished, I was marginally happy with the build. Overall, there are some flaws. There are a lot of flaws. There are a lot of things that I can do better, but that's part of doing a DIY project. And I swear, every DIY project that I've ever done, I thought to myself, if I did it again, I would make some changes and it would come out that much better. That's part of DIY projects as well. So as much as it's flawed, I know I could do better if I built a second one. So after many races of testing in the final version, I am even more confident in the wheel's strength and longevity. I have done many, many races at this point and it's never even made a funny sound. I also found that with the grips covered, the wheel was a lot more comfortable and even with my bad carbon fiber wrap, it really did look like a pro wheel for only 240 bucks. So as I mentioned, if I did it again, there are so many things that I would have changed or would have done differently, or I learned from my experience, which is part of the process as well. Because even if my next wheel is different than this one, a different style, I take what I learned on this one and carry it forward into the next. Now let's talk about things that I learned in this project. Hopefully you can learn from some of my mistakes and I'll carry them forward into my next project, starting with reading the plans. You really have to familiarize yourself with the entire project. So let me take you down my path and where we could have done better. I didn't use the same buttons, yet I printed his drawings. I had to change the drawing version too in order to reprint in order to use my components. When I made a component change, there was a design change. When I changed it at a different board, I had to do a design change, version three of the print. Same thing goes for your hardware. If you use different hardware, it might not fit in the same size holes as the drawing. So you really have to bring the whole project together in your mind, which is so much easier to say than actually do. And that is part of the DIY experience. And if you think about it, those design changes carried through all the way to the very end because I hadn't thought about my quick release on the steering wheel. And again, that was another change I had to make on the fly and part of the overall experience, there's no avoiding it. And that takes me to my next point. You have to take your time. You really do have to be patient. You have to think things through. You have to make sure that the decisions you're making are the right decisions before you print an eight hour part and find out it's already wrong. And that leads me to my next part of taking time, finish work. You really do have to take your time to do a little extra finish work. I didn't do anything to treat my plastic. I just started carbon fiber wrapping. Well, I had problems on the edges that were based on my inexperience with working with vinyl wrap. However, I also had some bubbles and I had some wrinkles or lines that were because of a rough printed 3D part. A little sanding, a little finish work would have given it a much, much nicer looking finish in the end. 
And then the last thing I'm going to say is stretching leather is not easy. So depending on your design, I'm not sure that is always the right answer to the question. When you look at a lot of steering wheel designs, they're fairly round. They're pretty easy. They're tubular. This had some complex curves that I had to deal with, and that was probably for a higher level upholsterer than me, or I need a fabric that's going to stretch a little bit more. So if I had to do it all over again, here are the main changes that I would make. Even if I built this exact same wheel, I'd find a stretchier material for the grips. I'd probably do away with the carbon fiber wrap because I just feel like wrap has certain inherent problems like bubbles and it never really looks that real to me. It looks like fake carbon fiber. I'd rather it be real carbon fiber, but you can't do that on a 3D printed wheel. So I'd probably just go with a high gloss finish, take that extra time, prepping it, sanding it, filling it, making it look really nice. Overall, the project took me a few weeks of time. It took me a week of 3D printing. It took me a week of putting all the electronics together, getting it into the wheel. And then finally, it took me about a week of finish work to actually finish the wheel off. And I have to tell you, at this point, as hard as I'd been on myself for some of the finish work, the wheel has really grown on me. I don't see those imperfections anymore. It is a very rigid wheel. I love the magnetic shifters. They came out very good. It's highly functional and it's comfortable in my hand. So overall, it was a win, win, win. And I would almost consider building an identical second one just to make those improvements, but I'm probably gonna go for a different style. I just have to decide on what. Is it another butterfly maybe with lights or display? Is it a hub? to use a Momo wheel rim on. I'm not sure yet, but I will be doing another one because it was fun and it was rewarding. I have to thank Fox85 on Thingiverse for your original design. It is mostly your design except for some changes in the layout, but thank you very much because it worked very well. I did donate to you through Thingiverse, so thanks again. I want to thank Derek Spear of Derek Spear Design for giving us the components, the internals, the buttons, and coders to be able to finish off the project. project. And then finally, I want to thank our Twitch viewers because I streamed Oh, probably 30 hours of this build, just sitting there soldering wires, and they're there helping me out, giving me suggestions, and they actually made it a better project in the end. So if you enjoyed watching this show, you want to see another one, be sure to subscribe so you're going to get a notification. But that's going to do it for this one. This is The Sim Pit. I'm Sean Cole, and I'll see you on the track.